There's um, a number of works. So that was clear from the first session yesterday in terms of how it's currently envisioned. And of course, there's more ways that it can enter in the current current version. Uh, it's a matter of like entering it through productivity growth uh, or potentially through labor force uh, participation rates and labor force growth uh, and, and perhaps in some other ways too. Uh, but in, in thinking about the risks <clears throat> and then in terms of how that, where that information actually comes from, a lot of that comes from these climate impacts analyses. And we saw that in the second panel yesterday where the climate impact analyses uh, are, um, uh, or the, the, in the, excuse me, I guess the third panel yesterday where the climate impact analyses are based on uh, historical evidence and historical data looking at uh, either granular from a bottom up approach or top down looking at GDP effects of <clears throat> various climate variables. All of this work has been important, but all of it clearly is just first steps in a much broader research program. The other, uh, the other thing we um, learned or recognized uh, or saw is that um, both uncertainty really matters and also the sectoral and regional differentials. I mean, we know very well that at a global scale, climate uh, really has going to have extremely different impacts uh, at different um, levels of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, at different levels of uh, different regional and different levels of scale. So, and, and of course it's uh, in the case that many of the uh, people who are gonna be hurt the worst and many of the regions that are gonna be hurt the worst in climate, especially in the short term, are ones that uh, are ones that had really nothing to do with creating the emissions in the first place. So uh, that granularity, if we narrow it down to say a, an individual uh, economy like the U.S. economy, which is the main focus here, that granularity, uh, there's there's really interesting features about it. Some of it washes out. So, or some of it might not be big enough to rise to national levels, or some of it might be handled by insurance markets. Other aspects of that granularity potentially could be cascading. And I think that that's one of the things that we might be talking about today, where in principle, uh, insurance uh, should be able to handle things like wildfire risks in California uh, and flooding risks in Florida. But um, if there's market inefficiencies or market frictions or regulations limiting prices, instead of just prices responding, then you might actually just see insurers dropping out. And if insurers drop out, then it goes up to goes to the state. And then you've got sort of this cascading problem of where these risks actually fall. Uh, then they fall on the taxpayer rather than on the reinsurance in industry. And sort of how does that fit in through all the financial system? And we're going to have some discussions of that uh, today. And um, I believe probably our uh, uh, are probably our last panel, and then related impacts of physical risks in our last panel. And then another theme that's really important is thinking about uh, the uncertainty of all of this. So there's many different ways to think about dealing with the uncertainty. Exactly what's the best way to deal with it is really difficult and it's problem specific. Uh, certainly in terms of formulating policy from the outset, thinking of optimal policy, optimal policy has to be really thought of as a sequence of optimal policies where you're learning as you're doing and you're taking into account all of the deep uncertainty that is associated with the climate problem and with how the economy is going to respond. Uh, there's the other aspect, which is as a practical matter, how do we evaluate our really difficult policies uh, that we, or complex policies that we implement today and our first panel is going to be looking at that, um, at, at least in at least a couple of the papers are going to be focusing on a case study of uh, evaluating the Inflation Reduction Act and, uh, uh, and I guess parts of it uh, looking at the IIJA as well and seeing how that fits in, how those policy evaluations fit in both from a macro perspective and from a, from a, a carbon emissions reductions perspective. So I think overall, this is like a big tour of um, some uh, of models that are used in in the government models of mo modeling families that are used in uh, in uh, in in academics to to think about formulation of policy and uh, models that are used in uh, in uh, the private sector and in um, and in other entities to actually guide the guide the construction and development of policy. So um, so with that, I think we're sort of covering the landscape, but it's a really big landscape and it's a really complicated one. And the thing that's super interesting about this is not just that it's important, but actually that it's evolving in real time. I think we're really learning a lot and the research is really um, blossoming and hopefully we'll be able to see a little bit more of that today. So Emmy, I'm just gonna turn this over to you for the next panel. Thank you, Jim. Um, our first panel will be about some aspects of the energy transmission, uh, transition, 
the title is Projecting Economic and Financial Impacts of a Transition to a Low Greenhouse Gas Economy. And we have uh, three speakers, three very exciting speakers, uh, Emmanuel Campilio, John Larson, and Neil Marotra. And the first two are remote. So um, with that, uh, why don't we start with uh, Emmanuel? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, lovely. Um, so uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, let me start with uh, telling you that, unfortunately, I, I fell ill a couple of uh, days ago. So I'll do my best not to cough uh, during my talk, but uh, I won't be the, the most brilliant speaker um, today. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, so we were asked to um, develop some uh, considerations about the factors that would be uh, good to incorporate into uh, macroeconomic models of low carbon transitions. And uh, there are several, of course, and some of them have been already discussed yesterday. Uh, let me uh, put forward for um, uh, the sake of uh, discussion uh, um, another one, uh, which is transition related expectations. So transition related expectations by, by this term, I mean everything that has to do with the with the low with the low carbon transition. So future policy implementation, the development of technologies, the possible stranding of physical and financial assets, and these are uh, key, of course, in defining the the future transition pathways because they define our investment choices today. And also, uh, potential transition related disruptions. This whole idea of uh, uh, climate Minsky moments or green swans. They often um, have the root in the misalignment of expectations uh, compared to, to reality. Um, so the very important to have in models, uh, they're also very hard um, to capture in their full complexity, let's say. Uh, behavioral economics tells us that expectations are messy. They are heterogeneous, uh, volatile. They're subject to cognitive biases. They're forward-looking, but with finite planning horizons. They're very influenced by what happened just recently, and um, it's it's hard to, to capture them. And the you know to a first approximation, the usual way of doing of, of having them is either the traditional neoclassical way, uh, which is usually based on no, uh, rational, homogeneous, forward-looking expectations or the complexity macro way, uh, which allows for heterogeneity more easily, but also relies on purely adaptive expectations uh, most of the times. Um, however, there are uh, recent lines of work uh, in economics, uh, for instance, the, the, the whole diagnostic expectations or the heterogeneous expectations kind of work that um, uh, have potential to be incorporated and uh, give new insights uh, for transition modeling. So what I will try to do is to very briefly um, uh, present you one um, application, one attempt at uh, including this uh, heterogeneous expectations approach, um, looking at uh, transition and policy uncertainty, together with a couple of co-authors. Uh, so the motivation is, is very simple. I don't think I have to explain it that much, but uh, um, we had uh, several uh, examples of policy reversals um, in the climate policy sphere in recent years. The Australian carbon tax is one example. Uh, the uh, complicated relationship of um, uh, the US with the Paris Agreement is another prominent example. And uh, many times uh, these uh, policy reversals are motivated by uh, concerns that either governments or society or both have um, around the costs of a low carbon transition. So this was, trigger this was what triggered the Gilets Jean movement. Uh, as we all know, but uh, there are many several uh, ma several examples also in emerging economies um, linked to fossil fuel subsidy phase out uh, proposals. Um, all this uncertainty about the policymaker commitment plus a number of other factors create um, a dispersion of expectations. We have actually very few data on this. I, I hope I will have the time to come back on this. Um, so this is the only. Um, survey data that we're aware of concerning uh, climate policy expectations. It comes from Refinitiv, uh, 
so what you see here, they asked in 2020 um, to a bunch of uh, carbon market professionals, what do you expect the EU ETS carbon price to be in 2021? That's the blue line, 22, 23, and 2030. And so we see that there's clearly heterogeneity in, in expectations, that this is also uh, expanding, increasing in psychological time. So the more we move in our uh, uh, planning horizon, the more uh, the, the expectations are dispersed. Um, but we also see that there's an increasing, uh, um, there's a trend of increasing carbon prices uh, on, on average. So we try to capture some of these dimensions um, by developing a, a dynamic model. We have uh, two technologies. I will not have the time in, in 10 minutes to go into any mathematical details of this. But we have these two technologies, uh, low carbon and high carbon, and firms decide how much to invest in each of them, depending on what they expect the uh, cost differential uh, of the two technologies uh, to be in the future. And these uh, cost expectations are in turn affected by carbon price expectations. So we assume that firms observe um, the policymaker announcement, uh, this G bar tau, that, that would be the, the announced growth rate of future carbon price paths. Uh, nowadays, of course, announcements come more in the form of net zero um, dates, uh, but you can derive the implicit optimal carbon price from that, and we use, we use that. And then the firms evaluate the, the credibility of the announcement, looking at the past uh, track, track record of the policymaker in keeping its word. And so we have these two populations, believers and skeptics, and each firm can decide at each moment to switch from one belief system to, to the other. Um, policymaker can decide to default um, on their goals if they perceive transition risks to be high. And so the actual tax implemented uh, can be different from the announced one, depending on the government's commitment uh, with this C parameter. So if uh, a government is fully committed, it will just do what they promised they would do. Um, if uh, instead it's, it's lower than one, then they will give some weight to transition costs concerns. And these two choices, uh, both the, the the degree of trust in the government and the investment choices, they are the heterogeneous um, across firms. And we have these two key parameters, this beta and this gamma, which we frame as responsiveness parameters uh, to signals, but ultimately they're, they're really linked to the dispersion of these um, uh, perceptions, these uh, expectations. Uh, and so we can move from a neoclassical limit, so to speak, uh, setting where both parameters are equal to infinity, so uh, expectations and beliefs are homogeneous, uh, to the other extreme where uh, basically choices are made at random uh, when beta and gamma are equal to zero. We, we, we never get uh, to this extreme. Um, and then we derive some first analytical results. Uh, so let me just uh, guide you through the, the main points here. Um, what you see here is a, is a steady state analysis, and the, above you see the um, neoclassical limit, so with the homogeneous beliefs and expectations, and below you have the heterogeneity uh, case. And the takeaway messages are that even if you have uh, um, homogeneous expectations and beliefs, you can still have certain situations in which multiple equilibria arise, and this is the case uh, of an uh, um, ambitious but weakly committed policymaker. So this, you, you need to think of a policymaker that tries to trick, so to speak, uh, firms into decarbonizing by loudly announcing that the decarbonization is, is coming. And we show that to some extent, in, under certain conditions, this actually works, um, even if there is no commitment. But if it doesn't, then it backfires and the transition completely fails. If we allow for heterogeneity instead, we get this situation in terms of steady states. And you see that the, the um, conditions of existence of, uh, of these steady states change, but also the nature of the steady states change um, if we allow for heterogeneous expectations. In some cases, they, they change for good, meaning if you look at this area, uh, for instance, um, we have uh, partial decarbonization with an 
unambitious but committed policymaker. And this is where we had no transition at all in the neoclassical limit uh, case. Uh, but in other cases, they change for, for worse. Um, and I'm referring to this area where we move away from multiple equilibria to go back to a unique steady state, which is, however, high carbon, if the policymaker is particularly um, uh, ambitious but weakly committed. And I'll just we uh, also, heads up on time. We have a couple minutes left. Okay, thank you. So um, the numerical results are, are similar. Again, let me just tell you the, what the main points are. Uh, what we show is that we, we calibrate everything to the European Union economy. And even with a, with a full co fully committed policymaker, we show that heterogeneity affects uh, the, the speed of transition. Um, I won't go into this chart just uh, due to the lack of time, but um, this is essentially what, what it says. And this is relevant, of course, because you reach full decarbonization eventually. Uh, but if it's uh, if the transition is lower, this means more emissions, more cumulative emissions, more temperature increase, more damages. And uh, the chart on the on the right essentially repeats um, what I already said in the analytical case. That is, you have certain conditions that trigger a vicious circle of credibility loss. Um, high carbon investments, uh, high perceptions of transition costs and weaker policies, eventually leading to, to a failure of the transition. So this, uh, so this was just an example. I just wanted to throw it out, throw it out there. Uh, but really there's, I think, a lot more work uh, to do in this area. Uh, some of it has to do with capturing the expectations, which we don't fully understand. Um, we, we don't have enough data. We don't really know how they move uh, properly. And there's a number of methods which are quite complementary to, complementary to one another, uh, like financial market uh, econometrics or surveys, um, natural language processing or, or experiments uh, that could allow us to calibrate the model and also develop more sophisticated models. Speaking of, um, this was just you know, one um, uh, first attempt. Uh, one thing that uh, might be relevant, for instance, in the US case is to have electoral cycles. And uh, finally, and I'll close here, um, the most important question I think is how to, how to manage all these expectations. So probably the ideal setting is one in which expectations are all aligned. Uh, they're as homogeneous as possible and aligned to the policymaker which hopefully is aligned uh, in turn to, to climate science. And uh, it's not um, easy to understand uh, what is the best policy institutional framework to achieve this. Central banks might have something to do with this, given that they, they have the know-how of uh, expectations uh, management. But of course, this um, uh, opens the, the whole discussion on whether they, they should be doing something about it. Uh, of course, they are doing something about it. Uh, this is just to say, uh, this chart is just to say that they are heavily communicating um, on, on climate change. So there's uh, something there to study as well. Let me conclude and uh, uh, happy to come back to any of these points um, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is John Larson from the Rhodium Group. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, excellent. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. It's really an honor to be a part of this panel and this workshop today. I'm John Larson. I'm a partner at the Rhodium Group. We're an independent research firm that does a lot of work both on the economic impacts of climate change as well as the policy impacts of emissions trends. And uh, I'm going to talk about the intersection between macroeconomic assumptions and U.S. greenhouse gas emissions today with using the uh, Inflation Reduction Act as one uh, policy example to explore um, as part of the interaction there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, very quickly, Rhodium Group's, all of our U.S.-focused energy system modeling starts with our version of the National Energy Modeling System, which is a platform created uh, by the Energy Information Administration. Uh, we have uh, modified it, operate ourselves, and maintain our own version of the model um, and make a, a number of additional augmentations and expansions to uh, represent um, emerging clean technologies and their role in the energy system, as well as updated assumptions around markets and 
policy and macroeconomic outlook. Uh, I will admit, you know, the the macroeconomic module in NEMS is certainly not as sophisticated as some other state of the art uh, components out there. But uh, I think, for, at least for this discussion, it's still a useful tool for showing kind of rough directional trends on uh, macroeconomics and. Uh, you know, um, but also just to know that this is our version of the model versus EIAs. Um, next slide, please. Um, and looking at our current policy forecast for 2022 that we put out last summer before the Inflation Reduction Act came out, we, we use, um, and we'll talk more about this in a sec, but we use a variety of different assumptions to construct different emission pathway scenarios. Uh, to reflect the fact that the future is uncertain. Um, one of the obvious areas of uncertainty is the rate of macroeconomic growth in the United States over time, and especially if you're looking out to say 2035, 2040, those effects can compound and be material over time. Um, and so just picking out two scenarios from our work, we had a central emissions pathway and a high emissions pathway that we looked at uh, as part of our range in 2022, of which the central emissions uh, pathway assumes a 1.9% annual GDP growth rate from 2023 to 2035. It changes after that, but just for sake of keeping our timeframes consistent here. Um, meanwhile, we had a, a high uh, macroeconomic uh, growth rate that was at 2.3%. The 1.9 is roughly consistent with what the Congressional Budget Office was projecting at the time that we were setting up these scenarios. Uh, the 2.3 um, is certainly more aggressive and reflected EIA's uh, central case for economic growth. And long story short, when you assume a faster growing economy, uh, you will have higher emissions, all else equal. Uh, on the right-hand side is the cumulative net greenhouse gas emissions under both scenarios, uh, holding other um, other assumptions constant. And uh, the key point here is over the course of the time frame between 2023 and 2035, we see almost two and a half billion tons more greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere uh, simply due to the drivers of uh, acro macroeconomic assumptions. Uh, next slide, please. Now, why do we see that? The, the, there's a lot of answers, but the primary answer is energy demand. Uh, when you assume a faster growing economy, your uh, industrial sector is producing more things, it takes energy to produce things. When you assume a faster growing economy, you have more people commuting, going to work, uh, and more freight and goods and air travel, which increases energy demand of the transportation sector. You also have more um, uh, income and in, with consumers, and they are spending that money on a lot of things, including energy services. Uh, and so you can see here between the two scenarios, um, you know, in some cases, uh, a couple of quads more energy demand uh, when you're looking across different sectors of the economy. And and I should say, uh, electric power energy is uh, incorporated into these charts here. So that that's a, a key. Um, part of this. Um, so, you know, emission, all, you know, like I said, there's a few other things here. I had 10 minutes, so I'm focusing on the key drivers here, but energy demand uh, is goes up with higher macro assumptions, and that is uh, the primary driver of uh, uh, emissions increases under higher macro assumptions. Next slide, please. Now, um, when we looked at the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act, we uh, started with a range of uh, assumptions in different scenarios while holding policy constant. So either with current policy before the IRA or after the IRA is implemented, we hold those policy specs constant. And then we had three main drivers of emissions trends that we considered uh, that translate into a low central and high emission scenarios. Uh, and one is fossil fuel prices. The higher the fossil fuel prices assumed, the lower emissions, all else equal clean technology costs, um, the lower those costs are, the lower emissions will be all else equal. And then again, uh, I already talked about economic growth and you can see how we took different assumptions um, across three different scenarios here to paint a, a range of potential outcomes. And I should say there's links in the slide deck here for reference if anybody wants to dive deeper into all the, all to unpack everything under the hood, we have uh, documentation there. Um, so keep this in mind when you uh, we go to the next slide. Um, which is 
our total net greenhouse gas emissions, the gray line is history. The blue and orange ranges are, um, the blue range reflects emissions outcomes without the IRA, and then the orange out, uh, range reflects outcomes with the IRA in place. And long story short, the IRA does a big, uh, makes a big lift. It gets as much as a 10 percentage point relative to 2005 emissions reduction in U.S. emissions compared to no IRA, uh, and getting uh, emissions as low as 42 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. Certainly nowhere near the target the U.S. current administration has set for the country of 50 to 52 percent, but uh, within one piece of legislation, it's a major step forward. Um, but what's what's actually happening there with regard to the emissions profile, given what I was just saying about macroeconomic assumptions? Well, the first thing to note is the higher ends of the range reflect higher economic growth assumptions in the first place. So uh, that means, you know, all else equal net emissions will be higher with the IRA than with higher macroeconomic assumptions than with moderate uh, macroeconomic growth assumptions. But even then, holding uh, macro constant, the high end of the range goes from uh, with was 24% below 2005 levels before the IRA and is 32% below with. So the IRA still does a lot, even with the high economic growth assumption in place. Uh, next slide, please. And it's important to, to understand why the emission reductions happen the way they do, given what we were talking about with macroeconomic growth, it's worth looking at where the emission reductions happen. This is uh, just from our central scenario, um, and this is uh, net GHGs across, across sectors. And by and large, the, the vast majority of emission reductions uh, across all of our scenarios, and uh, in this case in particular, occur in the electric power sector. This makes sense. Those are where um, some of the biggest, most lucrative tax credits are. It's also one of the most responsive sectors to climate policy, um, generally speaking. We do see some emission reductions uh, elsewhere across the energy system, including in industry and transportation, but uh, much, much smaller than, uh, in fact, an order of magnitude smaller than what we see in the electric power sector. So with that in mind, next slide. Um, uh, this is my last substantive slide. Uh, the uh, What you're seeing here and what the IRA effectively does to get the major drop in emissions um, relative to, to no IRA is a shift in investment from the traditional kind of pathway uh, balancing capital and uh, variable costs in the electric power sector, uh, shifting it somewhat over to um, higher capital and lower fuel dependence. So the left-hand side here is cumulative electric power resource costs from 2023 to 2035. Um, and the important thing to note here is that system investments go up. Um, this is this is absent subsidies. So subsidies are, are not counted in these values. Um, this is the total investment going into the system in response um, to keep the lights on, but also and serve energy demand. Uh, and with the IRA, you can see total investment goes up. Uh, O&M goes up as well. Uh, but you do see that uh, there's nearly $100 billion, a little more than that, in fuel savings because you are now displacing fossil fuel consumption with new uh, wind and solar generation. Uh, and uh, what that uh, what what I what we find interesting about this is that the rough total investment is about the same between the two policies, the with and without IRA in this scenario, um, uh, which means what you're really doing here is just directing that money into different uh, types of generation, and effectively what you're doing on the right hand side is just dropping the carbon intensity of electric power in the United States substantially compared to a no IRA scenario. So. Uh, you know, trends without the IRA did see um, the emissions intensity of electric power going down to about 2.5, uh, 0.25 tons per megawatt hour. Um, but we see with the IRA that getting as low, um, you know, getting cut by more than half down to as low as uh, 0.1 tons per megawatt hour by the early 2030s. There's a bit of a rebound. I'm sure everybody's wondering what that means, up to 0.15 tons per megawatt hour. And that is the expiration of the existing nuclear retention tax credit in the IRA. And those nuclear plants uh, are no longer economic and fossil fills in behind. But long story short, though, the, the key takeaway is carbon intensity is going down due to shifts in investment across the electric power sector by design from the subsidies. And, uh, and that is effectively getting you the emission reductions you need without any like real material shift, um, macroeconomically speaking. And why is that last point 
um, grounded? Well, it's because if you look at the total investment we're talking about uh, between 2023 and 2035, we're talking about a little less than $2 trillion either way, there's no net, it's substantial net change in electric power investment. And in a $25 trillion economy like today and growing over time, that is still a relatively small uh, com component of the overall economic picture, especially when you're taking, um, you know, on average, we're talking about like roughly $100, $150 billion a year in investment. And that's just not, you know, nothing compared to a $25 trillion economy. Uh, so, you know, what we, the, the key takeaway here, next slide, is that, um, macroeconomic conditions and assumptions around future growth are actually the bigger deal for directional emissions um, in US energy modeling, at least in the, the time frame we're talking about through the mid 2030s. Uh, and that's why the rest of this workshop is so important to get that right, especially as the climate is changing and new risks and disruptions are on the horizon. Um, and at the same time, policies do matter and can tackle climate change, uh, but what they're really doing instead of shifting the overall economy is shifting the carbon intensity of energy production and consumption. And that, uh, while important um, and probably has some sectoral implications from a macroeconomic perspective, are not uh, complete shifts to the broader macro picture. Um, and, and that's because the clean, scale of clean energy investment uh, while large, is still relatively small compared to the U.S. economy. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe the last point I'll make is that given all of this, uh, one takeaway for us is that there's plenty of room to meet the need of more decarbonization in the coming decades ahead in the United States um, uh, with regard to um, investment and other policy action that can shift uh, incentives and behavior over time uh, and uh, we should not be all that concerned about the macroeconomic implications because the macroeconomic implication uh, trajectory itself is actually uh, more fundamental and more important to the overall economic picture as opposed to the clean energy investment. Uh, so with that, I'll stop. And again, thank you for having me today and I uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Our last speaker is Neil Marotra from the Minneapolis Fed. Thanks um, so much for having me uh, on the on the panel. It's very nice to be here. Um, so like John, I'm going to focus my remarks on the Inflation Reduction Act and um, some recent work that I've done with Catherine Wolfram and John Weisslein trying to understand the economic implications of um, this largest piece of legislation to tackle climate change. So um, just you know, a brief review, IRA works to subsidize clean energy investment. It uh, has a set of uh, investment and production tax credits for clean power generation. Um, importantly, for our purposes, those um, subsidies are uncapped and they expire only after emissions targets are reached. So when assessing the sort of fiscal and macroeconomic implications of IRA, what really matters is how much take up there will be of, um, of these tax credits. There's a, a substantial piece of the legislation uh, that offers tax credits for households to purchase electric vehicles and to uh, purchase um, lower carbon uh, options for home heating. And then there's a set of incentives around uh, more nascent technologies like um, uh, green hydrogen and carbon capture and sequestration. So I, in my brief um, remarks today, I want to uh, think about what are the implications of IRA for energy markets and what are the macroeconomic implications of these, uh, of these provisions. So on the energy market side, um, our work uh, suggests that, uh, that IRA will have a significant effect on power investment, a 50% increase in power investment and a sizable reduction in CO2 emissions. I think our numbers are, are close to, to, to what, uh, what John is finding in his modeling. Um, we see that this increased power generation does raise the possibility of very low or even negative wholesale electricity prices. And I think that will be relevant for thinking about the supply side effects of, uh, of this policy over, uh, over time, the policy of subsidizing the um, uh, subsidizing power generation. And then we see a significantly higher fiscal uh, imprint of the legislation over the next 10 years of around uh, $900 billion relative to what CBO and JCT had originally uh, scored. 
So over, uh, over the next decade, um, the way we the way we try and look at energy investment is through the regen model. So uh, one of the co-authors um, is uh, at the Edison Power Research Institute, and the Edison Power Research Institute has a uh, has uh, an energy industry equilibrium model called regen. And so uh, what we do is we run these tax credits through the regen model to understand what will be the impact of um, uh, of this policy on uh, power investment. And what we see is a large increase in clean energy investment, a 50% increase relative to baseline. So if you look at the top bar, the top bar um, is um, uh, renewable power investment over, uh, over the past decade. It was around 20 gigawatts uh, per year in new capacity additions. Um, even before IRA, because of cost reductions in uh, in wind and solar, we saw uh, uh, we were projecting this model projects a, a, a substantial increase in investment in renewable power. IRA supercharges that, so there's another fifty percent increase on top of that. So relative to the prior decade, we're about we're projecting about a doubling of investment in solar and wind and, and battery. It's important to note that our projection is actually on the conservative side. So there are a set of projections out there, including um, sort of a, uh, so, uh, some influential analysis from a group at Princeton that argues that um, the, the IRA will really supercharge investment in power generation. They see, that's the bottom bar, they see a 5x increase relative to the prior decade in, um, in clean, clean power generation. So this, um, this investment in clean power generation drives lower carbon emissions. We see a seven percentage point reduction from IRA in U.S., uh, greenhouse gas emissions relative to, to baseline. This is again similar to what uh, the last presentation showed. That uh, moves us materially closer to the Biden administration's target, but doesn't get us um, uh, all of the way there. And these um, these emissions reductions continue into the into the next decade because um, because these tax credits don't necessarily expire at the uh, at the end of uh, 2030. So. Um, our modeling suggests that IRA will have uh, significant impacts on, uh, on electricity prices, and it raises the possibility that wholesale electricity prices could be driven to very low levels or uh, possibly even negative levels. So what this graph is showing is, you know, there are certain times of the day when there is high demand for electricity and certain times of day when there's low demand for electricity. One of the issues with renewable power is that it's intermittent. So you um, solar and wind don't necessarily produce at the times when there's there's peak demand. So if you sort demand from its highest hour, highest peaked hours to its lowest peaked hours, at the low peak hours, you're going to have times where there's relatively more supply of electricity relative to demand driving down uh, the price. And because IRA is subsidizing um, renewable power uh, investment, um, we see the possibility in certain markets that power prices could 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 fall um, could could fall very low to very low levels or even negative levels. Why could you have a negative wholesale price? Well, why would somebody continue to produce at a negative wholesale price because they can still co co collect the production tax credit? So, if you're if you're um, a solar producer or wind producer collecting the the production tax credit, you still have an incentive to produce even though the the wholesale price of electricity is negative. Now, do we expect the wholesale price of electricity to actually go negative? I think what what this will what these subsidies will do is that they will lead to changes in electricity demand that will um, that that will try to take advantage of uh, of these low prices and that's an important thing to uh, that's an important supply side effect that we need to to, to think through so um the upshot of all this uh, investment in power generation is that, the take up from these tax credits is expected to be larger than what was uh, than what was originally scored. So um, the left hand side bar shows um, the CBO JCT score of uh, the climate provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. 
They score those provisions as costing roughly $400 billion over, over the next decade. Our central estimate has uh, a cost closer to $900 billion. It's important to emphasize here that the abatement cost, so the, 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 the reduction in CO2 emissions for, for, for a unit of fiscal cost is still below the social cost of carbon. So in some sense, that's the relevant metric for assessing, uh, uh, assessing whether it's worthwhile, but there is a, a bigger fiscal imprint that's coming from, um, from, from this legislation. There is uncertainty around this. So we show two scenarios where uh, in the lower scenario, uh, which comes closer to the CBO JCT score. That lower scenario involves macroeconomic conditions that are uh, relatively unfavorable to clean energy investment and um, and uh, a reduction in the rate of, of um, and relatively pessimistic assumptions about uh, future um, reductions in cost. The high cost scenario shows um, greater take up of the various bonuses that are uh, available in the legislation and um, more incentives to uh, more uptake of, of carbon capture and, and, and green hydrogen uh, incentives than in the baseline case. So turning to the macroeconomic side, what are the macroeconomic implications of IRA? So um, we make the case in, in, in our work that on the longer, uh, uh, in the long run, IRA is um, delivering supply side benefits to the economy. It's a supply side policy that increases uh, output, wages, and and productivity primarily through a lower price of electricity. And electricity is an important input into uh, into production, and so um, that that's the supply side benefit over uh, over the long run. But uh, in the short run, IRA is going to stimulate a uh, considerable amount of investment demand, and that investment demand will uh, likely lead to a higher path of uh, interest rates than might otherwise uh, be uh, expected. Now, quantitatively, um, you know, we agree with the last presentation that these the, the boost in investment demand is relatively modest relative to the size of the economy. So we're not talking about large, uh, large effects. But uh, I think it's important to emphasize that the macroeconomic environment has a strong effect on on IR uh, on on the on the incentives to uh, invest in clean power. So one 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 point to make is that higher interest rates um, negatively uh, disproportionately impact clean energy investment because they're relatively capital intensive. So what the left panel is showing here is the sensitivity of the levelized cost of electricity with respect to interest rates. What you can see is that the flattest line is natural gas. So natural gas, where it has relatively more, the fuel cost is relatively more important to the capital cost, it's relatively less sensitive to interest rates. But other renewable technologies, because they have the capital cost up front, are more sensitive to uh, interest rates. So if we think that the macroeconomic environment is shifting to one of higher interest rates, that could negatively impact energy generation. Labor cost is also another factor um, where higher labor costs could, um, could uh, disproportionately impact um, uh, clean energy investment. So overall, um, the, the, we do see a big boost in energy investment, but um, those uh, impacts uh, in terms of on the demand side are, are relatively modest. Um, the reason they're modest is because electric power structures and transmission are a small part of the economy relative to GDP. So even if you have a doubling of, of the amount of investment in, uh, in the power sector, that's still relatively small uh, relative to the economy. So when you stick it in a model like Furbis, which is the Federal Reserve's US model, you have small increases in output and employment and core inflation initially, but those are but those are but those are uh, quite small. I think there's important limitations to this model, uh, this modeling that may understate the macroeconomic effects. It does not include upstream investment effects, and it doesn't include the combined effects of the Infrastructure Act and the Chips Act, which are all acting on sort of similar parts of, uh, of the economy that are all acting uh, on manufacturing and on, uh, on construction. So uh, I'm out of time. I'm just going to leave up uh, uh, our takeaways, um, but uh, look forward to, to talking more about this. Thanks.
Thank you very much. Uh, we now have uh, some time for questions and we're gonna extend the Q&A until 10.45 since we started a little bit late. Okay, let me uh, let me start with Jim Stock. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. This is just great. This is a really uh, interesting panel. Uh, thank you so much for your work. I have a uh, question for uh, John and Neil. So um, the theme of this conference or this workshop is uh, is climate. Uh, issues in macro. And of course, one of those issues is exactly what you're grappling with, which is you take a large policy. So the IRA is at least, you know, in, in principle, potentially a large policy that might have macro implications, and you need to investigate that. You need to see them. both of you conclude that maybe it's not that big a macro, but you wouldn't know that a priori, you actually have to do the work uh, for something of this magnitude. You have very different approaches. So one of them is running at using the um, using the uh, macro module inside NIMS, which has well known, very well known limitations. I mean, it's there, but it has it's it has limitations. Another is this sequential approach, <clears throat> I guess, Neil, that you took, uh, where you run this quite sophisticated um, EPRI model, and then you run a pretty a quite sophisticated macro model, you, uh, which is Furbus, but these things are like just like separate objects that are hanging out there. If you sort of said, okay, uh, scale it back, you know, pretend that we're in 2019 and you had the secret whisperer telling you that you'd be asked to evaluate the IRA in 2023, what sort of toolkit would you like to have have seen in terms of the macro, just focusing on the macro piece of it, not on not on the energy system piece or anything, but, but focusing on the macro piece of it. I can let John, do, would you like to go first or? Go hey, you go ahead, Neil, and then I'll go. Well, I, I mean, I've, I've thought a little bit about this. I, I, I think that um, you're exactly right in describing how, how we do it. Um, and and the sequential approach has 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 definite limitations. Um, I think the the spillovers that we are that we're missing through this approach is through commodity prices. And so um, the regen model is clearly having big effects, seeing big effects on uh, electricity prices, and potentially it's taking as given fossil fuel prices, natural gas and, and, and oil prices. But all of these things would be, you know, uh, if you if you had the ideal model that 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 had both of these um, components together, I think you'd have substantial spillovers there. And so when I'm when I'm sort of thinking, you know, backing up from models, if I'm thinking about how best to compare the expected macroeconomic impact of IRA, I think the relevant comparison is something like the shale revolution. And the shale revolution, um, arguably, like it, it had a really big effect on mining uh, investment and, and, and mining employment. That didn't really show up in, in, in the macro data in the sense that, that was, this was a time of, of, of slow recovery coming out of the, uh, uh, coming out of the Great Recession. But it did show up in commodity prices, and those commodity prices arguably had, you know, some some important implications for for investment and for for, for GDP growth. So I think that that if I had a model that could capture what the shale revolution was doing fairly well, uh, and I don't think Furbus did that, but if 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 you had a model that was doing was capturing that pretty well, then um, it, it's probably doing well on on thinking about the the near-term impacts of IRA. Yeah, and just, just to add to that, I mean, first of all, I completely agree with Neil about the interactive effects with commodities. Now, it's one that's actually one area where NAMS is actually fairly capable. Um, oil is an input, but everything else, all other fossil fuel prices shake out in equilibrium with energy demand uh, and supply costs. Uh, and we actually see gas prices go down because of the IRA, for example, because you now are displacing a large amount of gas demand, and that's putting downward pressure on prices. That said, I, I think on the macro side, uh, having a model with better granularity of the um, macroeconomic space generally, like Furbis would be one example compared to what NEMS has, 
and better feedback between the energy system and that macroeconomic outlook over, you know, in iterating over time, again, which is something NEMS does, but doesn't completely capture that macroeconomic feedback well at all. I'll be one of the first people to say would be quite, quite useful because, you know, even if these effects are relatively small, as we've talked about, they they are still matter uh, and they may have spillovers on commodities and maybe even over long, the long run, like device prices, you know, EV prices, other things that could be quite important to the long-term trajectory. And we're not, no one's capturing that right now. Just to add, and one more quick thing is that, you know, the, the Furbis model doesn't do a great job of, of capturing supply constraints, bottlenecks. Um, we've seen, you know, over the last couple of years, um, how, how relevant those are to macroeconomic outcomes, especially inflation. And, um, and so ideally you would want to, uh, IRA is taking place in a macroeconomic environment that's quite different than the shale revolution was taking place in a, a decade ago. And that's where I, my, my inclination would be that it's going to have more of a, it's going to come up against some of those supply constraints more and, and, and that could have more important uh, um, impacts. Thanks. And I probably should have started with this, but let me just, I think there's one um, clarification of something that Neil said. Uh, you mentioned that um, comparing uh, the cost of the uh, uh, IRA provisions to the extent that they've been calculated on a per ton basis compared favorably to the social cost of carbon. I think you might have mentioned per fiscal cost, fiscal cost per ton, but I, I think it's really system cost yeah. that you're, yeah. you, that you are, that's what you calculate in the paper, in your paper. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, George Kavortov. Hi, thanks for the very interesting presentation. This question is for, oh, this question is for the second two presenters. Um, and it's sort of about the energy system mod models assumptions. And that um, it's my understanding that there's basically kind of a, relatively stable final energy demand after implementing some policies like carbon tax or, or IRA, the subsidy. Um, and so it's sort of implying a relatively smooth substitutability between the between basically electricity and, and the fossil fuels. And I wonder how robust that is to some assumptions. So for example, I guess I guess the one hot topic is is battery minerals. I think in the energy systems models, they have kind of a very detailed modeling of like coal resources or oil resources. But I think it, it, I could be wrong, but it seems like the battery minerals are, are a bit like more of a nascent area. And, and then the second friction I was thinking of was the kind of human capital um, reallocation between brown industries and green industries, like the sk skill reallocation. That probably wouldn't be an energy systems model question. It's more of a macro labor type thing. But um, I wonder if that's maybe implicitly taken into account by like the cost of, I don't know, um, you know, making a new power plant or, or factory or something. Uh, I can speak to the first part, maybe uh, just quickly. Uh, in NEMS, mo it, you had it mostly right. It's, it's service demand that's roughly constant, um, different types of energy services. So for example, mobility is a relative constant and the demand for travel, which is different than the energy required to travel. Um, and so why I point that out as an important distinction is over time, consumers are making choices about what car to travel in. The IRA influences those choices. The energy demand and types of energy use change, but the VMT, the vehicles mile traveled largely doesn't, right? Like, so that that that's, that's one way that that nuance gets captured that you are getting at. Um, and uh, and and there's like you can make the same thing about like heat pumps and houses and and other stuff too, right? So, um, so there's stock turnover assumptions that drive that as well. Like each year, a certain amount of consumers are buying new cars, and then they make choices, right? Um, and um, so that that's that part. Uh, we and then the other thing I'll say is when on on minerals or other constraints, we just at the moment would say, okay, we'll assume assume higher tech costs generally as a reflection of that. And then how does that change people's choices? So that's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit blunt, but that's, 
the most kind of straightforward way to account for a lot of potential constraints in deployment um, or, or, you know, like both labor and supply. So that that's kind of how we approach it, but that's not, you know, ideally we'd be a little more in depth on that. On the, on the labor reallocation question, I think it's a, it's a very, um, a very interesting one. Again, in, in aggregate terms, the amount of labor used in power generation, investment, um, and transmission is not is not super large, um, even relative to the construction industry, which is small relative to the aggregate labor market. And so, um, so when you think about sort of scaling these things, it, you know, you can you think that it, it it's 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 fairly hard to get more electricians or get more. Um, uh, uh, more uh, specialized construction workers, but you know during the sh during the shale revolution they were able to do that fair, fair, fairly quickly, and and so I sort of come out that that we have a tight labor market today, so that's probably going to um, make it a little bit harder to 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 reallocate um, uh, labor, but um, but we you know we also have for example. Um, labor force participation um among you know prime age males has you know is is historically you know it's been declining for 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 a long time perhaps in the communities where this investment takes place there will be enough sort of labor supply at the at the margins to 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 come in and and quickly be trained up to uh to 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 do this um this, some of this work is specialized but but a lot of it is not is not super super specialized. Heather Boucher. Thank you. Um, this is great. I feel like I've been waiting two years for this particular session. So I think this is it's very exciting. Um, we uh, uh, I, I think I will speak for all my colleagues who've been so excited about this panel, but certainly these conversations. Um, so I have a couple of both comments and 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 a question. A uh, couple of questions. So, on the um, uh, one of the things just about electricians is that they often travel, um, which we, which I think people who think about it like uh, macro may not know that they often travel around the country to do their work. And so, that's one of the things that, in the back of our mind, we should be aware of. Um, and the other is that we are seeing this real big ramp up in con in construction, but that's going to be temporary, and that is going to be a mac like uh, you know we're ramping this up, and then it's going to probably fall down over time, and we might want to be thinking about that. But I actually wanted to come back to where this conversation um, started um, with the, uh, uh, I don't have all the names in front of me, with Emmanuel's uh, first uh, point about how um, the common reason for not doing or reversing these policies is concerns about unemployment and stranded assets. And yet um, these conversations, if the public could see them that, oh, there's no macro, you know, the macroeconomic effects seem somewhat muted or, you know, relatively small. Uh, one interpretation of that could be, well, the public shouldn't be worried about that. But underneath all of this is the challenges with supply side shocks, critical minerals, the um, labor reallocation, which is a fancy word for um, geographic differences in unemployment. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm just struggling with in the in the connection between the model and the, the modeling work and the policy is how we open up that space for policymakers to see that, um, to see some of those uh, impacts through the macro, through the through the macro conversations and tying it back to what you said, Neil, that the um, what we do on the macro side may have big implications for how effective these policies are. If interest rates have uh, um, uh, figure more prominently in some of these big capital investment sectors, then you know is the are the monetary authorities working at cross purposes? So, yes, my question um, to all three of you is: uh, as you're looking for to go to Jim's question, what do we want? Like, what kinds of fantasies uh, models could we kind of imagine that we want out of these tools that could help us connect better those dots between these what are essentially micro spatial challenges and the mac the macro way that we have these national conversations it feels like the models need to give us a, a little bit something different but i'm struggling with how we as uh how the modeling community should be thinking about that just again to connect back to emmanuel's very first slide and that very first question like why the public is so anxious about this transition that was a lot but 
sorry. Emmanuel, do you want to maybe go first? Uh, yeah, thank you for this. So let me just um, uh, react quickly because I was also interested in uh, uh, John and Neil's presentations about this. So it's true that um, several pieces of research, including the ones that we've just seen, seem to suggest that the uh, macroeconomic implications of climate policies uh, might be um, low or anyway, not particularly dramatic. Um, it struck me, however, how uh, both modeling exercises um, showed that IRA is missing the target, right? So none of them are actually delivering what the administration uh, announced uh, that they would do. So uh, one question that I had for them was actually whether their model could also be used in order to um, uh, derive, let's say, the optimal um, IRA, let's say an enhanced uh, IRA that manages to actually get uh, to the target. Uh, and what would the macroeconomic implications of, of this enhanced IRA uh, would be? So um, it's it's very difficult to, to, to capture uh, all of these implications, um, but, um, the policies that we have might not be the ones that we actually need. Go ahead, Neil. I mean, um, so so on the on Emmanuel's question about um, the the Biden administration target and not make IRA not being sufficient on its own, the 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 regulations on um, fossil fuel generation that were recently announced, those together with IRA do get you, I think, substantially closer and perhaps perhaps all the way. And so that was in our in our higher fiscal scenario, we were thinking about a scenario in which regulatory um, actions would um, incentivize more carbon capture and sequestration. And so those credits get used more, but you get more 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 emissions reduction. So I think the administration is thinking about, uh, and, and Heather and others can talk about this, is thinking about other levers to pull to, to get to, 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 to 50%. Um, and, and there is a, a range in, in all of our modeling about how much emissions reduction you get. Um, the on on Heather's question about reallocation and whether we're really picking up sort of what's going underneath the hood and 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 what might lead to more um, what sort of maybe voters into it more about like the costs of, of of transition. I mean, there's always there's always loss aversion. So people who are um, who are working in a particular industry that is that is um, that is that is um, losing out are going to feel it more acutely than those who um, may be uh, joining a new industry. And so that's obviously a political issue. That's obviously um, uh, but but does that translate on the macro side? I, I, I don't I, I, I'm I, I'm not yet convinced of that. the the question about does this look, much more disruptive to the labor market akin to the china shock like we were talking about i think is a is a relevant is is a relevant question um and and our models don't do a good job of of capturing those kind of sort of broad sectoral uh uh disruptions so um so that's perhaps something where we should be focusing more of our our attention on are we underestimating the 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 potential scope of of uh, uh of disruption just just to add a couple things to answer Emmanuel's question, we did, Rodium Group looked at kind of a pathway to the administration's target, um, which largely just layered on regulations, as Neil described too, um, alongside the IRA. And uh, in, in, importantly, not an optimal policy, just like what you would use in the existing toolbox. Um, so that that's a key caveat there. Um, and you know, what we saw is just like directionally similar results, just a bit more abatement in all the sectors and uh, not not some major shift and in wave in investment. Uh, so even, you know, I, I don't have the investment numbers off the top of my head, but assuming even if it was double or triple what we found in the IRA, that would still be a relatively small amount of the economy. 
Um, and so that's that's worth thinking about. Um, and then Heather, on your question, I mean, two things. One, um, I agree with Neil. I don't think all of the tools we have get at all the questions. Um, and I think that is an important area for for more research and improvement. But also, like it's it's we say this a lot at, uh, in in house at Rhodium. It's like it's not just the tools; it's how you use them. And I think folks like ourselves and everybody in practitioners in this workshop should be thinking about well, what are what are the right indicators to be looking at in these analyses with these tools to speak to these concerns, which is maybe different than what we would think of as energy system experts or macroeconomic experts, because uh, that's ultimately like when you're speaking to voters, right, or consumers, or, uh, you know, one one interesting interaction we have a lot is with the labor community, and they are much more interested in saving existing assets and retrofitting them for decarbonization instead of building something new, because they know they have labor union members in those existing assets, and they don't know what the new thing is going to look like. You know, th these are relevant and material factors in the broader policy debate that are not well captured right, in any kind of modeling framework. And so uh, I could go on, there's like all sorts of other anecdotes, but like, but those are those are things I think uh, everybody should be thinking about. We're almost out of time. So uh, let me take uh, two more questions just in, in sequence and then maybe can, we can hear one more time from everyone. Uh, so Tim Lenton and then uh, Wendy Edelberg. Thanks. Um, my question in essence is to what degree um, other models are already considering reinforcing feedbacks between sectors or feedbacks in general between sectors, but if they're reinforcing the potential for that to accelerate transition further. So just to elaborate briefly, you know, Neil remarked on the uh, extraordinarily cheap electricity at night. Uh, as a UK consumer, I can tell you I've got 100% renewable tariff with a peanuts price of electricity at night, which is a delight as I've just got an electric car, which I can happily charge for almost nothing. And if I could be bothered, I'd buy a battery, stick it in the garage, charge it up at night and run the house off the battery all day. And if I was a utility company fretting about not being able to flog the electricity in the night, I'd team up with a green hydrogen manufacturer, make a load of green hydrogen um, and then sell that um, at its market price. But my point is, um, there's reinforcement between the sectors, right? We know that ultimately, if you want to get 100% renewable electricity penetration, you need cheap forms of storage in the grid. But we also know that the expanding um, battery and EV market is bringing the price down of batteries all the time. And no doubt the same thing will happen in the green hydrogen economy. There'll be economies of scale. So ha ha basically, how, mu how much are feedbacks between sectors being considered, especially the reinforcing ones? Wendy Edelberg. I want to offer some downside risk to, to Neil's uh, excellent analysis, but it, so perhaps it's not surprising that the IRA's uh, climate provisions have positive effects because they're all subsidies. And in fact, if, if the IRA had decided that it wanted to subsidize the fossil fuel industry to lower the cost of energy uh, just from using more fossil fuels, that would also have positive economic effects. Uh, and so I worry about the negative economic effects, even if we were to finance uh, the provisions in the IRA using lump sum taxes. So we just totally wave away any of the negative incentive effects from those lump sum taxes. I think you still have to worry about uh, whether or not we have a higher rate of return or uh, you know a bigger effect on GDP from all of the investment that is being created by the IRA relative to the investment that would have been done with those taxes. Maybe we can just hear, uh, you know, less than one minute from, from each of you on whichever question you want to answer. Manuel, do you want to go first? Um, well, I mean, for the, for the first one, um, I don't think maybe I'm, I'm the right person to, to answer this, but um, I certainly think that um, a promising avenue of research lies in this um, uh, production networks um, approach um, that is able to capture sectoral interlinkages, both domestically and, and internationally. And uh, it's very, it's actually very difficult to, to 
make them work because you need a lot of uh, granularity uh, within sectors. Not often you have the data. Elasticities are not easily estimated, but uh, if one could, uh, then uh, this could uh, be answering some of your questions, Tim, I think. Neil or John? So on, on, on Wendy's question, I, I, I completely take your point, and we are very clear in our Brookings paper that optimal climate policy typically favors a, a, a carbon tax, which has the opposite sort of effects than, than the subsidies-based approach. Um, and, and, you know, the subsidies approach is, is predicated on, you know, important learning by doing um, effects, and, and I, I think that that's... that's um, that, that that that's worth um you know uh thinking about and interrogating and figuring out how 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 uh how how large those effects are um i i i would say that on this question of capital being other capital being crowded out that's true in the short run it's not true in the long run in the long run the the model will also say that that capital is actually crowded in because you know um, if non-energy capital is a complement to uh, uh, to to energy capital, then then uh, not even a complement. If it's just Cobb Douglas, it'll uh, it, you have um, it, the the marginal product of non-energy capital goes up. Um, so this I think comes back also to Tim's point about cheap energy. You know, people will find productive ways. I think of of using cheap, cheap, cheap energy. And I, as an electric vehicle owner, also um, was um, surprised to learn that if I charge at night, I only get you know uh, a, a price that's one fifth of the, the 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 typical price. And that's because they're trying to find ways to offload um, you know a renewable production at, at at night. And this may become you know. Uh, a way in which uh, you know utilities um, start to manage the 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 intermittency that they're they're actually going out there and supporting renewables and that's not something that that uh, s supporting electrification and, and EVs because um, because they have this this surplus of of, of energy um, and that's not something that our models are are capturing. Thanks. And, and quickly on the feedback point, we do capture the feedback between clean and fossil, but not a lot between clean and then perpetuating clean in large part because the learning by doing effects are hard to, to capture in, in the endogenously in the modeling framework. So like I said earlier, we see gas prices go down. That actually has a negative headwind on additional clean energy investment um, because you're, the price you have to beat is now lower. Um, but uh, but overall, the subsidies are sufficient enough to shift things. Um, and I wish we could have real time rates represented in our energy modeling framework. I think it would be an interesting outcome until it's like a common thing in the U.S. energy system. I think it will be unlikely that it's built into the model. Uh, I, I as an EV owner, I wish I had the tariffs that other people in the conversation had. And then the other thing, just very quickly on investment. I mean, we see more of a shift in investment, not a crowding out. Right? You know, and so it's we're building less gas plants in the model and building more wind and solar farms, right? And uh, and same thing with electric vehicles. It's like we're selling pretty much the same number of, elect of cars. You're just selling different cars. And so I, I think there's an important just like thing to keep in mind there around um, how, you know, the net crowding out is relatively small compared to the gross, right? And, um, and so that's just another thing to think about as far as all this transition goes. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, let me turn it, turn it over to you. Yes, great. Thank you, everyone, for the interesting panel. Um, we, we're going to break for the next, what is it, about 10 minutes before moving into the next panel, but we are opening the Slido again. Um, so for those that want to add more of their thoughts, insights, ideas, uh, you can use the QR code on the screen, or we'll uh, share the link in the chat in a second. Um, there are, I think I saw at least one question in there for a speaker, so I do encourage speakers to go on and you can reply to the questions that are in there. Um, otherwise, yeah, we'll reconvene at 11 uh, a.m. Eastern. <laughs>